Hello, my name is uh, Forbes Walker. I'm Environmental Soil Specialist at University of Tennessee Extension. And today we're going to talk about uh, climate smart agriculture and understanding climate smart agriculture. Um, as an overview to my presentation, we'll talk a little bit about climate change impact on agriculture, some definitions of climate smart agriculture, and uh, some of the similarities and differences between climate smart agriculture and other agricultural systems. And then talk about some of the main practices that we emphasize when we talk about uh, climate smart agriculture, tillage systems, cover crops, nutrient management, and water management. So in uh, terms of uh, global climate change, we know that uh, carbon dioxide levels have been increasing and uh, continue to increase. Uh, currently, uh, this is from the uh, NASA website, currently levels are 417 parts per million on average. Uh, in my lifetime, that's gone up about 100 parts per million. And uh, so, uh, yeah, carbon dioxide does cause this greenhouse effect, which traps uh, warmer temperatures in the world. And that leads to global air rising temperatures, both of the air as well as uh, warming oceans. The warming of the oceans has a significant impact on our weather patterns, especially our, our rainfall and our, our hurricanes and, and things like that. We know that uh, in the areas where there's um, ice and snow is common, the ice sheets and glaciers are shrinking, there's less snow, uh, not so much impacting us here in Tennessee, but in other parts of the world, it's got a significant impact. As uh, we see um, uh, temperatures rising and, uh, and ice sheets melting, we see a level in, in sea levels rising, and we see more extreme weather events. Impact on agriculture, uh, this is some information gleaned from the uh, EPA website. Uh, we know that higher carbon dioxide can, in some cases, increase uh, crop yields. However, uh, when we're talking about climate change, it's not just the increasing the carbon dioxide, but we also see changes in the rainfall patterns, increases in the, uh, the temperature. And so the uh, yields may actually be, may decline because of these other factors. We also see in some cases that the quality of the, uh, the crops that we grow may decrease the nutrient density and the quality, and uh, especially so in uh, different uh, forage crops. For example, we see a lower uh, protein content, which may have an impact on uh, livestock systems and livestock performance. With higher temperatures, we typically see more water stress, whether it be with plants, which typically uh, leads to lower yields. Higher temperatures also impact livestock performance, uh, livestock you know, tend to stop eating when they get too hot, when they don't eat so much, they don't put on as much weight, we don't make as much money. We're seeing um, rainfall patterns are becoming more variable, we're seeing more floods and more droughts. That's obviously got an impact in row crop production, but also has a significant impact on how we go about watering and feeding our livestock. And as weather patterns and climate change, we see diseases and pests emerging and changing. Uh, for example, in Tennessee, we've seen a, in recent years an influx a number of tick species that we haven't seen before. And we know also see some disease, uh, other novel pests of, of row crops as well as diseases uh, coming in as we see differences in the uh, temperatures and the rainfall patterns. This is a summary of um, a presentation that uh, Tom Wilbanks from Oak Ridge National Lab gave almost 10 years ago. Uh, looking at uh, uh, work that he did on climate modeling in the southeast and the implications for changes. So he was estimating higher temperatures in an already hot and humid area, especially in the interior during the summer. So we are seeing more uh, 95 degree temperatures than we did in the past. We're also seeing more severe and more frequent storms. Uh, we only have to go back a few, you know, a few years to uh, some fairly major flood events in Tennessee. You know, 2010, we had a major uh, event in the Nashville area where downtown Nashville was inundated with water. 2017, we had Hurricane Harvey come through the middle part of Tennessee after it left uh, Texas and, and dropped a lot of rain on, on us. And then uh, last year, uh, we just have to think about the uh, significant event in Waverly in uh, Humphreys County uh, where 17, over 17 inches of, of rain was recorded in a six hour period. So these uh, storms are becoming more frequent and more severe. 
we are also seeing a uh, higher sea level rise in the coast. Uh, the, uh, there's suggestions that you know, several feet in the next few years and that uh, the Gulf Coast may be uh, uh, you know, not the way it has been for many, many years. And uh, we're seeing more variable precipitation patterns, more flooding and more droughts. That obviously has implications for uh, how we uh, are able to get into our fields in the springtime to, to plant. If we've got wet, a wet springtime, that may delay planting. By delaying planting, we're going to be delaying our potential yield potentials. And then the final thing is we're seeing likely changes in economics, demographics, as well as environmental patterns, all due to climate change. Um, so climate smart agriculture, what exactly is? There's different definitions out there. There's a lot of similarities with the definitions. This is a definition I pulled from the web of, from the World Food Bank, um, the, the, the World Bank, where they, they talk about the integrated approach to managing landscapes that address the interlinked challenges of food security and climate change. So increasing agricultural productivity, enhancing our resilience, specifically enhancing the resilience of our soil systems and reducing emissions, reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. Climate smart agriculture, this is a definition that the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization uses, very similar to the one that the World Bank uses, transforming agri-food systems towards green and climate resilient practices. Three main objectives, sustainably increasing productivity and incomes, adapting and building resilience to climate change, and reducing and or removing greenhouse gas emissions. They talk about the four batters, so better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life for all. The uh, United States Department of Agriculture has uh, got some uh, climate smart initiatives. Earlier this year, they announced a partnership for climate smart commodities. They requested funds. They got up to a billion dollars in funding for some pilot projects using climate smart practices. Uh, I know there was over 450 proposals put into this particular thing, and we're, we're waiting to see who is going to be funded. Uh, back in August last year, they came up with an action plan for climate adaptation and resilience, uh, focusing on five um, main areas, decreased agricultural productivity, uh, obviously uh, changes in crop and livestock production, changes in re reductions in soil quality, increases in pests and diseases, uh, pollinator health impacts, as well as crop insurance. Climate adaptation holds often offers a significant threat to water quality and quantity, uh, depending where you are. So obviously more intense rain events, you know, obviously you know, more potential for, for floods, and the uh, impact there. Um, impacts on water quality, these floods may increase erosion and with the erosion, potential pollutants getting into our surface streams and waters. Uh, we see that climate um, change disproportionately impacts vulnerable communities. So a lot of the rural communities are more impacted than some of our urban communities. And uh, we do see some shocks due to extreme weather events, whether it be you know, floods or droughts or you know, wildfires, all significant effects impacting, impacting uh, communities because of, of climate change, as well as stress on the infrastructure and our public lands. Yeah. USDA adaptation actions, including building resilience across the landscapes with you know, significant investments in soil and forest health, uh, increasing their outreach and education to promote the uh, adoption of climate smart adaptation strategies, uh, broadening access to the uh, and, and availability of to climate data, uh, increasing their support for uh, uh, research on climate smart practices, and uh, working through their climate hub system, uh, delivering the adaptation science technology and tools. We are in the southeastern climate hub here um, in, the, in Tennessee, which is based out of Durham, North Carolina. Comparing some of the practices and uh, principles with different agricultural systems, whether it be sustainable, regenerative, conservation, climate smart, or organic, this is a, an article that was put out in the Crop and Soils magazine last a year by the Soil Science Society of America, looking at a lot of the similarities between these different agricultural systems. So a lot of them emphasizing soil health, keeping our soil covered, minimizing soil disturbance, maintaining living root systems, diversifying crop rotations, uh, increasing soil carbon, 
and um, other things like that. So encouraging cover crops, increasing productivity and removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So this is climate smart agriculture for us here in Tennessee. How are we gonna manage more frequent droughts and floods as well as higher temperatures? Uh, how do we go about building soil resilience? What kind of practices can we do that not only uh, help improve the soil quality and the soil help, but help to sequester carbon? And what can we do to uh, mitigate the uh, production of greenhouse gases? Obviously, if we're gonna be sequestering more carbon, we're gonna have an impact on net carbon dioxide emissions from agriculture, but we're still gonna to have to handle mitigating the effects of methane, which is obviously very important in our livestock systems, especially our uh, bovine, our beef and, and dairy sectors. Um, methane is also important in uh, different flooded systems, so rice production systems, so that's not really impacting us here much in Tennessee. Uh, one thing we, one other greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide is very important for us here in Tennessee. Anywhere we basically put out nitrogen fertilizer, we're gonna have some losses in the form of nitrous oxide, and what can we do to, to, to mitigate for that? And then also, what can we do because we're gonna see differences in our rainfall distribution, how do we better manage water um, on our landscapes through irrigation and water management? So building soil resilience, anything that we are doing to promote soil health, it's gonna help build soil resilience. Uh, remember, soil health is not just focusing on the soil chemistry, but also looking at the chemistry in combination with the physics and the biology. Chemistry is really important for uh, supplying crops with the co correct nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, sulfur, as well as micronutrients. It's really important to maintain a good um, uh, soil pH, and, uh, and you know, around pH six is what we recommend. And uh, paying attention to practices that help improve soil structure, uh, that help with our water management in terms of the soil physics, and then things that we'll do to actually promote the, uh, the, the health of the soil in terms of the, the promoting the soil biology, helping with nutrient turnover. Do we have a healthy microbial population? What can we do to ensure that healthy microbial population? And in turn, a healthy uh, macroinvertebrate population as well as earthworms. All these things in combination help us build soil resilience. The uh, United States Department of Agriculture for the last decade or so has been promoting different practices of soil health. Uh, so these practices are you know, not just one thing, it's things like crop rotations and cover crops and no-till and uh, living roots, um, crop diversity, keeping the soil covered, all these things together, helping to uh, promote soil health. Uh, practices that you know, minimize soil erosion, things like conservation agriculture and uh, protective covers, whether it be residues or cover crops and uh, help Practices that conserve and build organic matter. Obviously, reduced tillage is really important. And the judicious use of different residues and manures, as well as increasing plant diversity. And then a good balance between the, uh, the supplying the, the nutrient needs to the crops as to when the, the plants actually need the, the, uh, the, the, the main nutrients. As well as an overall good use, better use of natural resources through combinations of integrated pest management, use of manures, legumes, and crop rot rotations. So what do we know about sequestering carbon? We do know that reducing tillage will dramatically uh, uh, in reduce the amount of carbon that's being released into the atmosphere, and actually over time will increase the amount of carbon in the soil. We also know that cover crops can do this. Uh, there is some emerging literature on some other use of other soil amendments, which we've been doing some research on here in Tennessee, the use of biochar and gypsum, these things may not necessarily improve productivity of the crop, but they help us to sequester carbon and to sequester carbon deeper in the soil profile, which may have some benefits for future uh, carbon markets and, 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 and things of, of that nature. No-till adoption in Tennessee, we're probably the highest um, adopter of no-till in the, we are the highest adopter of no-till uh, in terms of percentage of uh, our, our land um, in, in Tennessee, um, maybe even in the, in the world. Uh, we've been doing it for, you know, 30 or 40 years. Um, back in 2018, the survey said that 85% of our soybeans are dedicated to no-till. Uh, our cotton and corn systems is 80 and 75%. Uh, in no-till. It's maybe higher 
as these trends do continue to keep on creeping up. We do know that no-till benefits are, are numerous, dramatic reduction in erosion rates. Um, we've seen, you know, with corn systems, we can reduce erosion rates from uh, over 100 tons per acre per year every year to less than one ton with, you know, cover crops and uh, uh, the use of uh, no-till and these high residue systems. The economics of no-till are in our favor. This is some data, some summary out of our uh, uh, field crop budgets for, 19, uh, for, for 2022. Uh, we see that the return on expenses for corn, no-till corn is $114 an acre compared with $92 an acre for, for uh, conventionally tilled stuff. And that's really because we reduce our machinery and labor costs with no-till systems. We do also see a gradual increase in soil carbon. We can see our soil carbon going from anywhere less than 1% to over 3, 3.5%. Three um, we need to see improvements in our soil physical properties to improvements in the aggregate stability, which is great for our water management. So we can see the no-till benefits in dry parts of the summer sometimes. And we see changes in our soil biology and microbial biomass. Cover crop benefits, we've also documented increases in, in carbon, whether it be total or dissolved uh, organic carbon, improvements in aggregate stability, and uh, which is great for it infiltration rates and, and soil water. We know that if we've got leguminous cover crops in our mix, we've seen more um, nitrogen in our systems, especially with these high biomass not leguminous crops like vetch. Uh, we see it's great for weed suppression. We see changes in soil biology associated with improved nutrient and carbon cycling and improvements in yields under weather extremes. Uh, these are all the benefits of cover crops. And so, these are some of the, the soil health practices that we're, we're quite familiar with, the, the, the tillage, the cover crops, the nutrient management. And we initially had these practices uh, looking at reducing erosion and improving water quality, but we're now seeing this. If you recall a slide, if you go about these different systems, uh, they're all many, many similar practices. So many of these practices that we were once calling conservation Ag practices are now we're calling climate smart agricultural things. And the idea is to build our soil resilience, let the soils better manage these weather extremes. And uh, there's also some of the, the things of the more carbon we can sequester, the more potential we've got to uh, meet the uh, economics, meet the, the markets of the future. Um, the, um, the, Briefly share this emerging literature coming out of uh, different places with the use of biochar, which is a byproduct from some alternative energy systems. We've got some biochar being produced in Tennessee from different organizations. So this is a study that came out of Iowa. They basically put biochar down at a rate of, uh, um, they put down seven tons, metric tons per hectare back in 2011. Uh, when they came back six years later to look at the, but the amount of carbon they had, they can see the amount of carbon they double. So the use of biochar to stimulate more carbon sequestration seems to be a technology that's worth investigating. Uh, gypsum, this is some work done out of, um, out of Brazil. Uh, we've got a lot of gypsum supplied in the, the Tennessee Valley through our uh, scrubbers from our, our coal-fired plants. But this particular study, uh, they looked at putting gypsum down on sugarcane in Brazil, and uh, they saw a significant increase in the carbon sequestration at depth. You can see uh, significant increases. Um, Sugarcane is a perennial crop, so this may be something that we might look at for some of our perennial cropping systems, our forage systems. This is a, uh, a talking about greenhouse gases. Again, CO2, uh, methane, and nitrous oxide. These are some estimates of the nitrous oxide emissions that we've got across the United States. This is a, a report that EPA comes up with. Basically, anywhere we put nitrogen down, we're going to see nitrous oxide emissions. So what can we do to reduce these things? Um, obviously, nutrient management and uh, paying attention to our, our, our nitrogen management is really important. So what is the source of that nitrogen? What are the rates that we're applying? Uh, how are we applying it on the surface? Are we incorporating it? And are we applying it close to when the crop needs it? I'll uh, point you to some work that my colleague, Dr. Fafa Adote has been doing here in West Tennessee. He's been doing a lot of work recently. I know he's got a few talks at the, the field day here where he's looking at nitrogen management, looking at the use of uh, different uh, stabilizers to uh, reduce the nitrogen losses. So obviously, you know, uh, when we use a, a 
fertilizer material like urea, we have a lot of losses. And he's looked at uh, the optimum rate in this particular study that he completed last year. It wasn't the maximum yield that was giving the optimum rate. It was a, a much, it was a lower yield. And uh, he was seeing the optimum nitrogen rate was 162 pounds uh, of nitrogen per acre. And then he found that splitting applications, especially when you're using more than 120 pounds was, was, uh, was beneficial. And uh, if you placed it um, at, uh, you know, op optimally placement was really important. So this, I would point you to the, uh, some of the great work that uh, Dr. Adete has been doing. Uh, he's recently come out with a couple of uh, uh, extension uh, publications that you may want to look at, looking at nitrogen fertilizer using different uh, uh, stabilizer products, as well as an overall thing on the corn recommendations for Tennessee. Water management, I won't go much into this. I know Dr. Shukuf and Dr. Live are talking about this, other things, but the big thing is, you know, are we looking at rain-fed or irrigated systems? If you are irrigating, are you using sensors to determine when you're going to be uh, uh, irrigating? Uh, what type of irrigation? Are you doing a full irrigation or what's called a deficit irrigation? Uh, we're seeing an increased use of tile drains, especially in the river bottoms. Like obviously, uh, if we've got a wet spring, uh, we can get those fields dried out. You can get into plant much more uh, quickly. And then the use of, uh, you know, how is our water use efficiency? Are we making the best use of our water? And uh, I know our, uh, my colleagues uh, are saying that, you know, even in wet years, because of the variability in our rainfall patterns, irrigation still play, uh, still pays. There'll be still sometimes, even in a year where it's got quote unquote, sufficient water, we will run into a deficit situation. And uh, this is my last slide, a picture of a, a kind of a thirsty looking corn crop. I'd like to sort of recognize the uh, United States Department of Agriculture and NIFA. They awarded us a, a, a grant to look at some of these issues uh, back, starting back in 2014. We uh, completed this particular study back in 2020. Uh, uh, so thank you for your time. And uh, with that, I think we will end the uh, presentation.